Good evening. Welcome to the Kelly Wright Show. We'll have your headlines in just a moment, but first, some opening observations about a very serious problem with our black men. We have a crisis on our hands and we need to keep sounding the alarm. We need all hands on deck to save our black boys and men from falling into a vicious and pernicious culture of the school to prison pipeline. Now the school to prison pipeline is a process through which students are pushed out of schools and into prisons. In other words, it is a process of criminalizing youth that is carried out by disciplinary policies and practices within schools that put students into an adversarial cycle with law enforcement. Too many black boys and men are going to prison rather than going to school or getting a trade. We can and we must do better. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist and father of civil rights, believed in the power of education. He knew it would pave the way for black men to gain true freedom and equality. He is quoted as saying this, it is better to build strong children than to repair broken men. When President Obama was in office, he launched a White House initiative called My Brother's Keeper. He continues to help young black boys become men by helping them face the challenges in this 21st century. Now let's be clear. We see many African American and Latino men making great gains in all disciplines, business, medicine, science, law, and so much more. But as long as we have some black and brown boys who are still disproportionately mired in a system where justice and opportunity can be denied, well, our work is not done. Let me make it perfectly clear that for our young, gifted, and black boys, prison should never be accepted as a rite of passage. If we do the work as mentors, we can become the village that raises all of our children to strive for excellence. And that's my observation. And now, your headlines. The Nevada caucus is coming up at the end of this week. Early voting is already underway, and this will be the first test for the remaining candidates to gauge their support in more diverse communities. Maybe in this place, a bunch of the Republicans, when he says jump, they say how high. That's not true of regular people out there, including some electeds. Uh, they think this is going to be a decency check on this president, a patriotism check. And so he can claim victory all he wants, depending on what happens on Wednesday. Uh, but I think people know what went on here. Are you ready to put the tweets behind us? This is our chance. This is our only chance. You know, Mitch McConnell's GOP may have dominated the Senate that was the jury last week, but we are the jury now, and the verdict is up to us on this president and on those senators who protected him. The process in Nevada is different than Iowa and party officials want to make sure they don't have the same problems that plagued Iowa's caucuses. But several volunteers in Nevada have already been sounding the alarm, and campaign officials say state party leaders are being vague about their plans to secure the integrity of the caucus process. Early indications suggest voters will turn out in full force. Over 18,000 people voted early this past Saturday. Fortune Americans have now been diagnosed with coronavirus. The new cases were diagnosed aboard a cruise ship. More than 300 Americans who were on the ship have been brought back to the United States where they will be tested and quarantined for 14 days. The number of new cases continue to rise around the world, and health experts fear the virus is entering a new phase. Health experts still don't know the source of the virus and are working to find an effective way to treat it. The number of confirmed cases here in the United States now stands at 29. People in Mississippi are fleeing their homes in droves because of historic floods there. The flow of water from the reservoir into the Pearl River strained to hold off the inevitable. The governor ordered evacuations this weekend and warned people in and around the state's capital of Jackson that the dangerous conditions are not over. More rain is expected this week and it will be days before the floodwaters start to retreat. Officials say the worst is still ahead. The NBA All-Star Weekend just passed and it was a more somber weekend as the league honored Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna. 
The NBA legend and his daughter died in a helicopter crash a few weeks ago, along with seven others. The players wore Kobe's number 24 in a tribute to him and the number 13 in a tribute to his daughter. The NBA also announced that it is renaming its MVP All-Star Award after Kobe Bryant. Kawhi Leonard of the Los Angeles Clippers is the first player to win the newly renamed award and said he was honored to receive it. Uh, it was very special. Um, like I said, I had a relationship with him. Uh, you know, and, you know, words can't explain how happy I am for it. You know, uh, able to put that trophy uh, in my room, in my trophy room, and just be able to see, you know, Kobe name on there. Uh, it, it just means a lot to me. Um, He's a big inspiration in, in my life. Uh, you know, he did a lot for me. Leonard scored 30 points in the game and hit eight out of 14 three-pointers. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. We've been following the breaking political news of the day. Federal prosecutors are weighing new charges that bring Lev Parnas investigation closer to the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Joining us how to sort all this latest political intrigue out is political strategist Dr. Avis DeWeaver. She is a Democratic strategist and also author of the award-winning book, How Exceptional Black Women Lead. Thank you, Dr. DeWeaver, for joining us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. What do you make of this entire Rudy Giuliani situation with Lev Parnas and their company and the $500,000? It's, it's just a mess. It, it is a huge mess. Uh, and unfortunately, it's really not that surprising to me. What we're seeing here is a consistency of one thing, that there is a consistency of people who tend to be involved with the legal activities that continue to surround the president. And I'm not surprised at all uh, that Giuliani is involved at, at the level that it looks like he appears to be. Of course, he denies uh, being having any involvement with all of this, but nevertheless, does it ultimately lead to the president of the United States? It absolutely does. I mean, Come on now. Uh, how many times does uh, there needs to be a connection to him before people actually see the obvious? Uh, you know, it's really funny how, you know, first of all, his thing was, I've never seen the guy, and I may have taken a picture with him, and then there's, what, like, maybe a dozen pictures with him, and there's all of this uh, sort of drip, drip, drip of information that came out during the entire impeachment proceedings, specifically by Lev Parnas. And so, um, unfortunately, this is one of those things where it's not going to go away. Uh, the further we go down the road, the more information that will come out. So, we're beyond impeachment. The president, of course, acquitted for that, and those that's behind him. But now this is lingering. Mm -hmm. Does this show or pretend some problems for him in the campaign? You know, uh, in terms of the campaign, I'm not sure. Uh, and the reason why I think that it's not necessarily going to hurt him in his campaign is because I believe that those people that are with him are with him, no matter what. a very strong base. <laughs> exactly. That's very loyal. They're no not going what. anywhere. They're not going anywhere. And I think the people that would have been turned off by this were turned off by this long ago. So that's kind of been baked in. At this point, I think a lot of this is going to be a turnout race come November. Speaking of a turnout race, race it's also we're going to Nevada yes. and then South Carolina mm -hmm. who do you see getting Oof. more of a lead in Nevada yeah so this is going to be very interesting this is the first state uh, that is a actually diverse state it's right very diverse <laughs> and let's let's remember that this is the state that Joe Biden this and uh, South Carolina these are the states that he wants. Exactly. Does he have, have any chance in Nevada? Uh, you know, I think it will be difficult for Biden to win uh, in Nevada. Um, it, it, it will be close, but I'm not sure that he will win. I think that his best chance for an outright and perhaps even very decisive win will be South Carolina, where we have a 60 percent black voting population in that particular race. Um, in uh, Nevada, you have the Latino population that's very strong there. Uh, there have been several candidates that's been playing very strongly to that uh, particular audience and some of the Latino population for example is holding a little residual um, you know I guess 
angst around Biden in terms of the policy that uh, President Obama had in regards to his immigration um, specific focus. To the point focus. of the deportation, exactly. and things of that nature. So, so he's, he's run into a little bit of a problem with that with the Latino population, and that might hurt him a little bit in Nevada. Well, it is a challenge, and it's a hurdle in front of him and an impediment to him performing and outperforming Bernie Sanders yes. or Buttigieg. Yes. So who do you see actually coming out a winner? It's hard to predict. It's very hard to predict because there was a little brouhaha um, between the uh, culinary union and Bernie Sanders uh, where they ref they specifically, they just put out a basically a fact sheet uh, that specifically said that uh, their particular union members would not be able to keep their health insurance under um, Bernie's Medicare for All plan and his people went ballistic. And so then there was some back and forth around that. Who knows what are, what's the ultimate fallout is going to be as a result of that. What's interesting is also that it was rumored that uh, the culinary union was going to actually uh, endorse Kamala Harris before she came out of the race. So they've just decided subsequently not to endorse anyone. It's, it's really up for grabs in, in my estimation at this point. Do the Democrats have any chance of coalescing and finding a candidate of their choice uh, or will Mike Bloomberg come in and upset everything? This is the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Mike Bloomberg is the wild card that's just sitting He's there. He's having some wild moments right now from his past. <laughs> oh my gosh. There are things yes. surfacing. Yes. And because of that, does he face some trouble? Will he be able to tiptoe his way through all of those things that are coming against him beyond stop and frisk? That's a good question. I mean, there are land mimes everywhere when you look at his background. And the thing is, he is counting on the fact that people want Trump gone so bad uh, that they are willing to hold their nose and vote for him anyway because they believe that because of his financial firepower, that he might be able to provide a very strong showing against Trump. And there are others who are saying that maybe that, you know, that's really not enough for them. And so at this point, you have a, a party that's very much divided between uh, are we going to go with uh, individuals who are on the more far left side of our party, mm -hmm. or are we going to go with more centrist people? And at the end of the day, are we even just going to say, forget it, let's go for the guy with, that's got the billions of dollars that can just sort of bombard Trump come the general campaign? It's really up in the air at the moment. And President Trump is tweeting away, watching yes. all the candidates. He has something to say about everybody. Dr. DeWeaver, welcome to the show. Please come back anytime you choose. Absolutely. We'd love to have your insights on the political trail as well as what's going on in terms of the intrigue of the White House and this whole Rudy Giuliani thing that's going on. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for having me. When we return, we talk more about politics, but also an interesting view of Bill Cosby, an update about him from Dr. Ben Chavis, next. For over one year now, global TV icon Bill Cosby has been imprisoned in the state of Pennsylvania. There's been only one journalist that has had the opportunity to visit Cosby inside that prison. Dr. Benjamin Chavis of the National Newspapers Publishers Association joins me now with his exclusive insights. Doc, welcome to the program. Tell us about your encounter or your various interviews with Dr. Bill Cosby. Well, uh, thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to be back on the Kelly Wright Show, and thank you for what you continue to do on the Black News Channel. Well, thank you. Uh, I've known Bill Cosby for, for many, many years. You know, there's an old axiom. Uh, you don't know who your real friends are, not when you're at the top of your game, but when you're in, in, in trouble. So very true. So I, I was privileged to visit uh, Bill Cosby three times, and on the last time, it was on the record. I'm pleased to report to you that in spite his unjust prison uh, sentence and incarceration on flimsy charges, um, he's, he's, he's doing well. Not well by being locked up, but well in his resistance uh, to his unjust incarceration. Uh, he's mentoring prisoners, he's teaching, uh, he's writing scripts. Uh, the, the Bill Cosby that you and I know publicly is still the Bill Cosby uh, behind prison walls, but he's resilient. And that's the point he wanted me to say. And of course, he's watching what's going on in black America today. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he wants us to make sure that we stress uh, our family values, uh, stress uh, taking care of our loved ones, stress uh, doing something to raise up a generation of, of, of young people, millennials, who know uh, what it means to uh, strive for excellence. Uh, the Bill Cosby Show, as you know, was fundamental. It turned a lot of people around to see black people in a positive light rather than a negative light. So, and, and of course, his case is on appeal. Right. Uh, he's hopeful that he will be able to get either a new trial or be totally, uh, have the charges uh, reversed uh, on appeal. What does he say about his critics and detractors who say that he got just what he deserved and they believe that the charges were just, those who came out against him? Well, there's been a lot of information that's come out since his trial, uh, new information about some of the uh, lack of credibility of the witnesses that testified against him. Uh, you know, uh, there's a parallel going on. The Harvey Weinstein trial is going on right now. It's going to jury. Uh, people see, well, how is it that Bill Cosby goes to prison and Harvey Weinstein may get off? So people are asking those questions. The race plays a factor, uh, Kelly, in the criminal justice system, and race played a major role in the uh, unjust conviction of Bill Cosby. I was just going to ask you about that because many people are asking uh, why is Harvey Weinstein appearing, uh, as it were, that he would go off scot-free and have his freedom for egregious crimes that he's been accused of, and yet you have Bill Cosby in a prison uh, on charges that many people will say, well, did he really deserve the kind of prison time that he received? Right. Keep in mind, Cosby was not convicted of rape. He was convicted of aggravated uh, indecent assault. And so the thing is, um, very technical charges. Uh, now he has to fight to uh, clear his name, uh, hopefully get a new trial. He's got a new set of lawyers that are working on the appeal. You know, I know something about uh, in my own life, been a member of the Wilmington 10 in the 1970s exactly. about unjust incarceration. Took us a decade to prove our innocence. Tell but us the how. The important thing is not to give up, not to lose hope. That's very good, but, but tell us quickly uh, how unjust incarceration uh, adversely affects and impacts African Americans. A mass incarceration, we're disproportionately uh, incarcerated at state level, federal level, in juvenile justice. Uh, uh, from young age to uh, elderly status, we're disproportionately incarcerated. So race, racism, uh, white supremacy, all these things are institutionalized in what is known as the judicial system and the criminal justice system. I can't let you go without asking you about that uh, and drilling down that a little bit more because we know that there's a school to prison pipeline yes. that is impacting black boys and Latino boys at an alarming rate and it seems no one's really throwing up their hands and saying That's let's right. stop this let's, or throwing up their hands and joining hands together it's so to do something about it. It's so commonplace. So what do we do about it? it? Well we have to continue to uh, raise this question and uh, certainly um, we've done some investigative journalists from the National Newspaper Publishers Association. We're studying this issue. And it's not only young black boys and Latino boys, it's, but also, it's also girls, it's women. Also girls. Uh, I'm so thankful you're doing this stuff about missing black girls because we're also finding out that women now, and particularly young sisters, are being disproportionately criminalized. Uh, even the way they wear their hair right. in some states now has become an offense where they're facing criminal justice charges just because of the way they wear their hair. Well, it seems we all have a lot of work to do on both sides of the aisle, whether you're Republican or Democrat or Independent or black, white, brown, whatever. We've got a lot of work to do to save our youth because they're the hope for our future in this Absolutely. country. Absolutely. It's an intergenerational struggle. From our young people to where Bill Cosby is today unjustly, we have to continue to be vigilant. We have to continue to be forceful, and basically calling for fairness, calling for equality, calling for equal treatment under the law. And that's what our country is founded on. Absolutely. Dr. Benjamin Chavis, thank you. Back with more right after this. When I was growing up, I always had a mentor around, 
I'm the product of a single parent home. My mother did everything she could do to make sure that I would grow up as a man who had a destiny and a purpose and that I understood that in my mind. It's important for other men to reach out to young boys and help them grow up as well in a society of fatherless men. Tony Lewis Jr. joins me now to talk about that and reaching out to men. And you don't have to do this, but you do. You reach out to mentor young boys to help them escape the school to prison pipeline. Why? Yes, sir. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, my father went to prison when I was nine years old. I'm approaching 40, so uh, 31 years I've been a child of an incarcerated parent. I know the immense impacts that can have. Uh, not to mention my father went to prison. My mother pretty much um, started to battle severe mental illness. And growing up in a community in the, like the one I did, going from being a child of an incarcerated parent and um, engaging in criminality and ending up in prison is a very common thing. So for me to be able to navigate through that and uh, become an activist and an author and a community pillar, um, I feel like it is my duty to reach back um, and give back and be an example for young people like me, boys and girls actually. So Tony, it's personal. It's very personal, incredibly personal. Um, and also I help men and women when they return from incarceration. So um, I want to help children when their parents are away, but also when, they, when the, this family reunification piece, when people return from incarceration, I try to re help remove the barriers to help them get employment, help them get stable so that they can stay in our community and not just contribute to their children, but also contribute to our community as a whole. So you're talking about a problem that, that, that uh, all of us uh, tend to be exposed to if we grew up in the hood. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I grew up there, you grew up there, sure. and, and I don't mind letting people know that, me but <laughs> uh, I, I know the hard work that my mother put in to help me, yeah. and I know the mean left hook that she had to keep me straight. How about that? <laughs> but who was your role model? Who was the one who said, Tony, this is the way you have to go? Yeah, ironically, um, you know, the guys that the world called gangsters were my role models um, in, in a positive way. My father, even from prison, uh, you know, did his best to keep me on a straight and narrow. My uncles who were in and out of prison, um, they felt like they did the things they did so I wouldn't have to. And, and, and at the end of the day, my grandmother and my aunt, right? And my mother, even in, within her mental illness, gave me those uh, those jewels and that push. Uh, in my community as a whole, I come from Hanover Place here in Washington, D.C. has been synonymous with the underworld. But yeah. the people there uh, saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and, and made me um, focus in on education and push me. Uh, not to mention just sort of the realities of our community. I, I lost so many friends to incarceration and death, and I knew that could happen to me. Um, um, and so the power of education for me was the thing that uh, helped, helped me. And then service, when I started doing violence interruption at 20 years old, right? So for 20 years I've been working with marginalized populations and I fell in love with it. Really that saved my life. I saw the impact that I could have on folks and I've been doing it ever since. You know, you're part of the, uh, the solution. Yeah. You're not part of the problem. Uh, what do you say to families that are reunifying after a man or a woman comes out of prison uh, and in particular, let's talk about the men for a moment because how do you build the esteem back in their lives so they're not committing recidivism? Yeah, I think uh, mass incarceration has been the biggest destabilizer uh, mm. in our community. Yeah. And uh, as a whole, uh, for the people returning, I, need, I want them to be patient, I want them to be disciplined, um, to fight with everything they have not to recidivate. But for the broader community, we have to remove these barriers. Hiring policies have to change. People have to be allowed to, to do it the right way because we can't fairly judge or assess them when they're trying filling out 500 applications and they won't get hired um, and they still have children and families to support. And we cannot, you know, ignore that fact. So some of that is on the society, on society and, and, you know, I'll get up every morning to sort of remove those barriers, try to work on policy change, um, help craft legislation to what, help What those can we do on the Kelly Wright Show to make sure that we get out in front of this and assist you in those kinds of policy changes that are so necessary? Because I know, in my, again, going back to my own life, I've, I had a good friend that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. He went to prison, I went to college. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he's, he was never able to get himself on the, a firm foundation because he was denigrated and maligned by society, they would never hire them. Indeed, having, having these kind of conversations, um, when you have people that are uh, 
within the political structure on this show to really have real conversations about this particular issue with them uh, and what their plans are to do it, not just from sort of a, a talking piece standpoint, but like real concrete legislation. Like, what's their plan to remove these barriers? Because we can talk about prison reform and changing laws, but if people are still marginalized and not allowed to, to vote, not allowed to work in certain places, um, are we really, really trying to do that? And then the other piece of this really is what are our schools doing to identify those children of incarcerated parents and support them? Um, those children are super resilient, um, but we know that the data tells us that they are much more likely to experience not only that trauma, but other traumas when you have an incarcerated parent, and we mm. have to catch them before they fall through the cracks. So in other words, we've got a lot of work to do. We do. I'm we willing to join you with that. I appreciate it, sir. I, seriously. Right, not just you. for the sake of a show, but for the sake of a life. Oh, we need to do this. Yes, sir. Tony? Thank you. Thank much. you. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you. His name is Tony Lewis Jr. He's doing a great work. We should all get behind it. I'll be back with more. John Taylor Chapman is a historian and is the founder of Manumission Tour, a company that focuses on sharing African American history through walking and bus tours. He joins us today to share why interactive black history is important to our culture. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Your, your tour sounds uh, fascinating and certainly here in Washington, there's a lot to see interactively. Tell me about how you do it. So about four years ago, uh, I decided to start the company uh, and focus on Alexandria's African American history. Um, because um, growing Alexandria, up in, Virginia? Yes, sir, okay. Alexandria, Virginia. And so growing up in Alexandria, Virginia, I did not hear a whole lot about African American history. And, and as I've learned, there is a lot of African American history there dating back to the 1700s. And so I wanted to expose that and tell uh, folks in our region, as well as folks that come to our region to visit about that history. Now, for those who don't know, Washington, D.C. is probably one of the most uh, visited places in America, in the world for that matter, and Alexandria is just uh, uh, across the river. That's right. And Alexandria goes back to the tobacco trade. It does. And slaves helped build that economy. In fact, without slave work, it would not have uh, been profitable. So is that what you show, the, the, the haunts of that past? So we talk, uh, we talk all the way through uh, the beginnings of uh, Alexandria and the region, uh, starting back as, as early as the 1600s, uh, when we know that colonialists came to that region, uh, all the way up through uh, the Civil Rights era. Uh, so we cover a lot um, in a number of different tours. Uh, our main tour focuses on uh, the early, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, and the transition of that community uh, as it dealt with slavery and abolitionism. Virginia, uh, during the Confederacy, of course, was the capital, Richmond, Virginia being mm -hmm. the capital uh, of the Confederacy. And I, I, I go back to history, and I'm thinking about how President Lincoln could actually look across and see Alexandria. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Civil War period, how did that go for slaves working or being under the tyranny of Confederate uh, soldiers. So Alexandria was one of the um, southernmost uh, places that um, slaves could actually run to and get their freedom. Uh, we know that a so it was part of the Underground Railroad. Uh, and so during the Civil War, um, it was it was home to thousands of contraband uh, individuals that had run across uh, enemy lines or behind enemy lines and to the north, uh, and they had settled in Alexandria. Um, the, the northern soldiers um, would house people in um, tents and tent camps in the city, uh, and some of, many of the men would go and fight for the north. Okay. Let's talk about manumission. Sure. What does manumission mean? Because a lot of people have not heard the term. Yes. So let's educate uh, all of us about manumission. And I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because the reason I picked that for the name of the company is it, that exact reason. Uh, so most folks don't know the term manumission, but they know the, the term freedom papers. Uh, and so the freedom manumission is the legal term for freedom papers. And so if you received a manumission, you received freedom papers. If you were a manumitted slave, that means you had your freedom because of that piece of paper. But you had to present those papers because if you couldn't, That's right. as we saw in the Harriet Tubman movie, mm -hmm. a movie, you couldn't get access to certain 
places across state lines. That's true, and you could also, and unfortunately in Alexandria and some of the other places uh, near this in the South, you could get jailed uh, and possibly re-enslaved. Alexandria has uh, a former Negro slave jail uh, where uh, individuals that had lost their manumission papers could be taken. And you include all that in your interactive tour. We do. We John, do. I want to thank you for having the insight to do that. Thank you. And the creativity and entrepreneurial skills to go out and That's do right. it because it is a very uh, wonderful thing. As many people know, they can always visit the African American History Museum here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But if you want more of an experience, make sure you go to Alexandria as well. Absolutely. John. John Chapman, thank you. Thank you very, Pleasure very to much. Have you. Thank you. Back with more after this. My next guest is Jody Davis. She is an exceptional and creative designer whose style is edgy and one of a kind. Some of her clients include Gail King, Kathy Hughes, and Soledad O'Brien. She is currently working on her spring 2020 line and is here to talk about some of the hurdles she has faced as a black designer. Jody, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to meet you uh, because fashion, as you know, is one of those one of those uh, last frontiers that black women have created so much buzz about. And there you are engaged in it. How did you get there and what were the hurdles you had to climb? Well, I'll, I'll tell the story. When I graduated from high school, my thought was I was gonna be a veterinarian, but uh, my dog got sick and his eyes turned the, the color of my dress. I was so afraid of him wow. that I was running from him. But one of my most memorable award rewards was a best dressed student when I was in high school. And I started sewing um, one summer, and then one thing turned into the next. Started getting compliments from family and friends, and then from strangers. And it took me many years to realize what I looked at as a hobby was actually my gift from God. It is a gift indeed, and now that you have this gift, it's the gift that keeps on giving, it would seem. I would say, yes, yeah. thank you. You're working with some stellar people out there, people that are noteworthy. When it comes to fashion, what's your sense of style? Because it is edgy. My sense of style is just uh, a piece that makes a statement without you saying a word, something that's classic, that's chic, uh, fashion, fashionable, um, and it just it makes you feel comfortable and confident. I, my specialty is women's dresses, and I design dresses that I like to wear, and in turn, my clients like to wear. Just a dress that um, it just, it fits you well, it flatters, the, I love colors. Are you accepted in the industry or did you find that there were some obstacles you had to break through some perhaps barriers that were racially motivated that, to try to keep you marginalized? Well, I actually have created my own path. So those barriers that are out there, I've not um, uh, paid much attention to because I have found my niche, my client base, and from doing so, continue to grow the brand and the name recognition is starting to grow. So I feel that if I continue to do what I'm doing, stay in my lane and perfect my gift and my craft, the, um, the doors will open. And in the age of social media, it, it would seem that it would be a, a benefit to you. It's a benefit in a sense, but then social media has made it so that um, it's, it's created a, a realm of fast fashion. So women uh, will look on social media and they'll find, see these dresses and they are inexpensive and then you get them and you can wear them once or twice and then they wind up in the landfills. I like to say my, my dresses are um, classic timeless pieces made of great fabrics, great construction. So I have clients that have pieces in their wardrobe that they've had for 10 and 15 and 20 years and they can still wear it, still relevant. And so all of those things I feel are important. There is something uh, very attractive uh, about your industry. Uh, and I'm reminded of the Ebony uh, Magazine fashion showcase that they did yearly where these beautiful, stunning, attractive uh, black women would go around the country uh, displaying fashions. I mean, the you know, it was just awesome. Yes. Do you see a day of that ever returning where there can be these kinds of shows that would go around the country to infuse positivity in our young black girls so that they would grow up and have a sense of style, a sense of class? 
I'm hopeful that that era comes back right now because uh, everything is so casual. You know, you can go to work and dress down casual. You can go to church, dress down casual. So there's no um, emphasis on dressing up in a sense. So currently in this state, I don't see it, but hopefully in the future, it'll come back. I'm looking forward to it. It's, yeah. it's a style of that that was all our own. I'm thinking about the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and, and even the 70s where, where so many men and women dressed, dressed to up. the nines yes. just to go to work. <laughs> exactly. And not just their Sunday best, it was right. their daily it, best. Exactly. And it made su it has such an impact. And nowadays the, the fashion world has changed. And uh, so when you see luxury, it's, it's rare. It's not, it's not the norm anymore. Well, Jody, thanks for joining us on the Kelly Wright Show. Please come back. Next time you come back, you'll have to show us some of your fashions. But you're <laughs> rocking a beautiful color, and uh, I believe that black girls rock. There's a lot of thank power you, Mr. In what Kelly. You do. I agree with you. Stay edgy and stay thank classy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jody. Thank you. Coming up, a special musical treat from Howard University Gospel Choir. Howard University Gospel Choir has a mission to spread the good news of Jesus Christ through song. Joining us today is Reginald Golden, the choir's music director and conductor, who is here to talk about the past, present, and future of the group. Welcome, Reginald. And Golden, you remind me of Jill Scott, living my life like it's <laughs> golden, golden. So, but, but tell me about the golden moments and opportunities that you've received by one, attending and graduating from Howard University and then going on to become the director of the university's gospel choir. Yes, uh, I graduated from high school in 2008 and moved to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. then. Uh, my mother says, you know, Reggie, you couldn't have scripted a better Howard experience than the one that you've had. Uh, my freshman experience there, um, I got the opportunity to, to travel internationally with the university choir. I was a member of the gospel choir um, and have been with the gospel choir since that time, graduating twice from Howard and uh, from the recording, from a lot of the international tours, to seeing a brand new group of members join the choir every semester. Uh, my time with the Howard gospel choir has been full of gold moments. What's it like for the students? Uh, one thing that the students definitely find, one thing that I found when I first came was family. Um, and a lot of people, you'll find it everywhere. That's one of the great things at Howard University. There's a group for everyone. I had a friend who was on the bowling team, and those were some of her best friends. Um, and so the Howard Gospel Choir provides an opportunity, a space uh, for people, for like-minded individuals, for people who love to sing gospel music, for people who love God, for people who love living um, in community to be able to find that family, to be able to find that fellowship that they're looking for. I like the way you said that, living in community and fellowship with one another because it underscores and undergirds our foundation in our faith, the faith of our fathers, the faith of our modern day era, and gospel music has played a significant role in the history of our people. Absolutely. And so as you do that, what are some of the things that you try to, to convey to audiences around the world who may not be familiar with gospel mm -hmm. and the history behind how it helped us uh, even beyond slavery? Uh, certainly when you look at gospel music, the term gospel means good news. When you speak of the good news, you're speaking of um, the good news of Jesus Christ and of our, of our faith walk, of God who loves us and a God who has always wanted to be with us. But when we look at gospel music as a music, as a specific body of work, as a specific genre, we're looking at uh, body of music that meets these three criteria, right? So it's one sacred in nature, speaking of vertical relationship and how that vertical relationship then impacts horizontal relationship. Mm -hmm. We are looking at a music uh, that has inside of it these characteristics of, you know, uh, of African vocality and musicality, stuff that was found um, prevalent throughout the music from the continent of Africa, stuff that we brought with us. Um, and then we look at it uh, from a third context from the historical context of what was going on. So what's going on in gospel music when people like Thomas Dorsey and, mm, and Charles Tinley are, yeah. are, are, are writing these 
are writing these songs, these classic songs? Yeah. What was going on in the black experience? What was going on in the in their own particular religious experience? And so when you um, you know, when you're training up a, a new group, a younger group, they have to know, well, one, you know, it has to be, you know, gospel music. Gospel music certainly has changed and transformed sure and sure grown, it but it has to be steeped and rooted in in what was gospel music. In the truth. Of the, in, in the yeah. truth. Yeah. And, then, and then I think also importantly is just the message of hope. It's just this juxtaposition of what reality is, of what real life is, but also the hope that is to come, the glory that is to come, the support that we have from this God, from this Jesus who has always promised to be with us. Yeah, well not only you are you are a, a great ambassador for God and faith in Jesus Christ, but you're also a great ambassador for Howard University, which uh, has such a reputation known around the world for its contributions to the growth of the African American community. And we need scholars, and we need scholars who understand music and how music makes a swoon with faith and mm -hmm. hope and love. So I'm just so honored to have you on. Next time you come back, you gotta bring the choir. Thank we, you, we, definitely. We, it's, it's their day off, to, but, <laughs> and so that's no problem. But next day, next time, you gotta bring the choir so we can really show out and have an entire show divided, d devoted to uh, all the great things you're doing. You got a new album? Don't let me leave without you talking about the new album. Okay. What's the new album? Uh, the title of the album is Glorious God. Uh, it was released not too long ago, um, and we were blessed to be nominated for two stellars to make an appearance Come on the Billboard. On. That's good. Um, got so uh, music, you know, charts. So it was a, a wonderful time for us, a wonderful season, and we're excited about uh, the things that we have coming up. Reginald Golden, thank you, man, for all the work you're doing with the students over there and, and give our best to Howard University. Thank you. Keep on living your life like it's golden. Yes, sir. <laughs> right. Yes, sir. Lift every voice and sing, man. All right, coming up, we will hear the glorious sounds from the Howard University Gospel Choir. That's next. And now my final word about today's show. At the top of the hour, I talked about Frederick Douglass giving this quote, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. It goes to the core of why it's so important for all of us to embrace black boys when we see them get into trouble and try to correct them like the old school days. If you saw something going on, you said something to the child. But today, a lot of times, we're afraid of our own black youth. We should not be. We should reach out and bless them and help them to lift them up because they are part of our future. It's like the song says, I believe that children are the future. Teach them well and help them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Let them learn the greatest love of all is with God and loving themselves. Hopefully, you've been ignited and write it and keep on spreading love, freedom, and peace out there as we leave you with the latest song from Howard University Gospel Choir, Glorious God. Peace out. Holly, honey. The song just says, Thine, O Lord, is greatness, power, and glory. Thine, O Lord, is victory, and all the majesty. Oh, oh, oh thine, O oh Lord. All the honor belongs to you, God. Everything in heaven and on earth belongs to our God. What our eyes see. God, our help, God, our help of ages past.
has is here with us. And he promised. Paul said it, Romans. For my record that the sun brings up this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory he promised he would reveal in our lives. Every situation under your eye, under your control, because everything in heaven. And the power and the glory forever and ever and ever, yeah. He is the glorious God, yeah, yeah. So that's why we came all the way from Washington, D.C. Hey, just to declare that we love our glorious God. Hey, holly, hallelujah. Hey, shower down. Send your power, Lord, and your glory. Fill us with your spirit, show your glory, sing it, oh God, shine, show it out, sing your power, we need you to fill us with your precious Holy Spirit, show your glory, oh God, you are, hey, hey, hallelujah, you're glorious, there's nobody like you. He's the king of the ages, you are. You're the God hey, who sent his son to die on a tree for you and for me. Hey, God reigns forever. He's the king of the ages, you are. Put a these on my hands, and it won't be very long. You're going to look for me, and he would have called us to meet him in the sky. He's a glorious God. Holy, holy, holy. 